You said you're going to record, correct? We are now. Okay, perfect. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Matt Webb. I'm with UT Extension in Marshall County. Uh, appreciate everybody that's on with us today. Uh, we also have Jesse Shanks. She is our small ruminant extension specialist with, uh, with the University of Tennessee. Uh, she is joining with us today on our lunch series. Uh, we've been doing these for Tuesdays and Thursdays for a while now, and we're going to continue on into June. But uh, some of our group that's been organizing this reached out to Jesse uh, to present a topic. And so we're going to talk today about preparing sheep and goats for the breeding season. Um, if you are involved in sheep and goats, you know that our bottom line is affected by how many babies that we have that are born and then also how we get those to market. And so, Jesse, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And then when we get closer to my part, I'll jump in and do that. We ask that. If you have a question, you can drop it in the chat box, but we're going to try to wait to the end of the presentation uh, before we answer any questions. So with that, Jesse, you're free to take over. All right, thank you, Matt. And thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. I see we've got about 16 people on here and I know a lot of people asked Matt about this being recorded. So hopefully lots of people will get to see this information. So thank you for having me. And like Matt said, we're going to talk about uh, preparing your small ruminants for breeding season. And what I've got here is not um, an all-inclusive list necessarily, but it is a, a way to kind of get started thinking about the breeding season and, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, things that we need to do for our small ruminants. So in terms of things you want to think about, when we're looking at breeding season, obviously for most of us, not all, that is going to start this summer. Um, so a few things that we need to look at, and, and for, the mo for the most part on here, I'm going to talk about late summer and fall breeding, not necessarily breeding for fall lambs right now um, or out of season breeding, you know, for kids and lambs. but all of these things kind of need to be looked at um, no matter what time of year you're breeding. So think about it from this uh, perspective. We're coming out of spring. Some of you have lambs that are, you know, three, four, five months old even. Um, you've got your ewe flock or your, your goat herd. They've been sheared. You've probably got everybody out on pasture. Um, so these are just some things that uh, I thought about when, you know, sitting down and looking at our priorities here. Number one is gonna be body condition scoring. Um, body condition scoring, like I'll talk about here in a minute, is very important and cannot be overlooked. Breeding soundness for both males and females, we'll go over that. We'll talk about parasites. Um, I'm gonna mention flushing there towards the end, and then Matt is gonna talk about pastures. Um, but through all of this, you've got to prepare for these certain stages and you've got to, to do that to help you make decisions. So we'll go into body condition scoring here. Um, and I say these numbers because I have been trained to look at these numbers and use them for data input and those types of things. But what I tell my master beef producers when I teach the repro section of that and what I tell sheep and goat producers, you need to understand that there are two skinny ewes and goats. There are ones that are just right, just enough body condition. And then you have some that are obese. So I want you to look at these pictures I'm about to show you or drawings and kind of think about where your females fall in this. So one would be you're emaciated. They are, you know, struggling with um, obviously getting enough energy and nutrients, but they also could be weak um, due to malnutrition. You're going to see lots of bones on their body, just looking at them from the side and from the rear. Those are the ones that would be too skinny if you just want to put a blanket term on them. The three to three and a half is going to be the just right. That is our average 
they have enough fat cover um, to get the job done in terms of breeding and maintaining themselves. The fives, if you wanna put um, just a general term on them, they're too fat, way too fat, over conditioned. Um, and when you're feeding them extra nutrients along with the rest of your ewe flock or goat herd, you are essentially feeding them to be non-productive or at least less productive than their counterparts. I've got some numbers down here also, um, your optimum stages for this, and I got this off of an article that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the title here in a minute from Margot Hale. But for breeding, you want them to be in that three to four range, that average just right. Early to mid gestation, you want them to be two to five, 2.5 to about four. So two and a half to four. Lambing, if they've got singles, you want them to be um, in that score three to three and a half. For twins, you want three and a half to four. And then weaning, once you pull those, um, that offspring off of those females, you want them to be at a two or higher. And we'll talk about that more here in a minute. So these are pictures that have been drawn um, and Jay Thompson and H. Meyer from the University of Oregon Extension, they actually put together an, an excellent article. Um, and maybe I can share that with Matt and he can share that with you guys. But they put together an excellent article and I actually screenshot these pictures from Matt. But it gives you a great look from the rear of the animal about where you need to look. And without me standing here with sheep with you or goats, in person like we would all um, like to be at this point but can't this is a good way to show you what I mean by these body conditions so this is a score of one obviously this animal would be considered emaciated and you can see here I don't know if you guys can see my arrow moving around there but the top here is the spinous um, process this part it's the top of their spine that is going to be sharp and prominent and we've all probably seen these females at one point or another. Maybe it's an old you that, that you just struggle to keep weight on. I completely understand those. Some goats get this way as well. The key is to not let them stay like this. You want to help them gain weight either by deworming or other management strategies. Their loin eye muscle is shallow. So right around in here, um, Think of where you would feel a market lamb for that loin. That is going to be shallow with no fat cover. The transverse process that you can see down here on these, these lower two arrows, you can easily see those and you can feel them. You can pass your fingers underneath the ends um, and it's possible to feel in between each process. So this is body condition score one. You don't want them to be at this body condition score um, you know, during breeding season, because if they are, their body as females is saying, you know, I don't have enough nutrition to actually maintain myself and reproduce and maintain an offspring once it's born. So her body at this point is not saying, yes, reproduction, let's ovulate lots of eggs, let's have lots of lambs and kids. Her body is saying, I can't even maintain myself, so I don't need to reproduce. Um, so her nutrient demand here is not something that she's gonna be partitioning over to reproduction. So keep that in mind. And it's also important to note, um, depending on which papers you look at, it takes about 15% of that body weight of the animal to go from one score to another. So if you have a 150 pound you um, that needs to move up to a different score, depending on, you know, what breed and everything, she's going to need to gain about 20 pounds to actually move up in a body condition score. Um, so it, it takes a lot of weight to move up. And you've got to think of this in terms of your breeding season prep, because if they're at a body condition score of one in August, and you're about to turn the ram out, She's going to be gaining weight in August and September, you hope, if you're, you know, feeding them um, or they have great pasture and hay at their disposal, but she's not going to be thinking about breeding. So you need to think about that. That's why the optimal numbers there that we just had on the other slide 
recommend higher numbers entering breeding season. This is a body condition score of two, and you can just see there's more fat cover here. There's actually some loin muscle, um, but very little. So this animal will be considered thin. Um, your spinous processes are sharp and prominent, but the loin eye muscle is a little bit fuller. There's actually some muscle there. She would not be considered emaciated to the point that you could see every single bone um, you know, in that the spinous process and the transverse process. Condition three, this is what we call average. Your spinous process is smooth and rounded, um, and you can only feel the individual processes with pressure. So you'd have to take your fingers and, and smush them in there to actually feel it. The transverse process is smooth and well covered right here. You're not going to be able to slide your fingers under there but you will be able to feel them with firm pressure. The loin eye muscle is full with some fat cover. Again, this condition three is your average, just about right. Now, condition four, this is where we're getting into fat. Your spinous process can be detected only with pressure uh, as a hard line that you're going to feel. You're not going to feel individual bones whatsoever. The transverse process cannot be felt. Even with firm pressure, there's that much fat there. And you'll notice as a sheep or a goat puts on this much fat cover, they kind of take on like a canoe shape. They get more rounded um, in the middle, a little bit rounded on the ends, if you will. Um, so just keep that in mind. A fatter animal with more body condition is going to look more smooth and rounded in appearance. The loin eye muscle is full with a very thick fat cover. Condition five, this is what we would call obese. Um, you can't detect their spine. There might be a fat dimple over it, but that's about it. Um, you're not going to detect the transverse process, and that loin eye muscle, again, is very full with a very thick fat cover. Um, typically, ewes and does that kind of go into the breeding season like this, they didn't have those nice, um, you know, fleshed out lambs that you typically like to have. They probably didn't lactate really well. So they're the ones who are going into breeding season looking like they haven't done much work um, because they probably haven't. Now, um, something to look about in terms of your male, and this is for goats and bucks. We expect males to do a few different things for us, right? And we only use them during certain times of the, of the year. So remember, um, from basic reproduction, sheep and goats are seasonally polyesterous. This means that they have multiple estrus cycles in one breeding season. And that is typically when your daylight starts to decrease and your days get shorter. Um, we could go into a whole talk about how that is managed. I do that in my sheep and goat class. But for now, um, just realize they're seasonally polyesterous and they like to breed in the fall. Um, this gives us a short window of time for optimal breeding. We don't have all year to get our females pregnant. We have a short window of time to actually get them pregnant. Um, so you want your males to settle a large number of females early in the season. That gives you time to, um, to get your females pregnant. That gives you time to get those pregnant that may need an extra cycle, uh, but that should be a goal for your males. You want to continually improve your offspring as well. So you're gonna do some selection techniques as well, both on males and females, to keep improving your herd or flock. So a breeding soundness exam, and I don't know how many of you have ever done these. Um, they're not, something that is horribly invasive for sheep and goats. I used to do them with my sheep and goat class. Obviously, we couldn't do that this semester because of the virus. But um, a breeding soundness exam does a few things for us. It identifies fertile and subfertile males. It needs to be done around one month prior to breeding season. Um, this kind of gives you the best indication of what that male is going to do in breeding season in terms of his sperm. And it also gives you time, if needed, to find a new male to breed with. 
Um, I've been in a situation before, not because of a breeding soundness exam, but we had a ram, one of our only mature rams die uh, in July one year. And we had to travel, um, you know, in a quick amount of time to go get a new ram so we could have him for the breeding season. So um, that was because of a ram's death, but you could have something similar happen in your situation, or you could have a testicle problem, a sperm problem, whatever, um, whatever it brings. There's several components to this. And once you do a breeding soundness exam on your male, if you are uh, looking at getting him reimbursed through the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program, you will need a breeding soundness exam for that male. You want to avoid the remark, and you see this picture over here that I've got from Premier One. This is good, you've got a few colors here. What you don't want to see is purple, and then orange, and then yellow, and then black, and then red. You don't wanna see the ram um, continually marking the same females or the buck. Wanna make sure they're not doing that and remarking them. So the components of the breeding soundness exam, you've got the physical exam, uh, the vet will look at reproductive organs, and also semen evaluation. In terms of structure, during this physical exam, you're going to make sure, the vet's gonna make sure the male can be, um, can get around, can move well, doesn't have any foot problems or anything like that, um, and that they're physically able to breed females. This is where they might recommend some hoof trimming as well. Um, and body condition scoring, like we just talked about, is a component of this as well. You don't want your ram to go into breeding season or your buck um, in a body condition score of two. You want him to go in in that three to four range because when he's busy marking females, he's not really worried about eating. I, I've had some rams that, you know, come up with the ewes to eat. I've had some that, no, they're out chasing females and they're not interested in eating. So you need to expect your males to lose a little bit of body condition. So you don't want them to go in uh, too skinny or too fat. Your veterinarian will also look at the reproductive organs. Um, typically, it's going to be the penis, the prepuce, the sheath, and then the testicles and the epididymis. Obviously, the testicles are what produce sperm. The epididymis is along the bottom of the testicle and the side. And we look for uh, swelling there, um, heat, hardness, or anything that could indicate some different infections. Um, we can't really look at the internal secondary sex organs simply because we can't palpate a ram's, um, a ram's sex organs like we can a bull. But your vet will evaluate those other parts. They'll also look at scrotal circumference. And um, in Tennessee, we've done a good job of this in, in beef cattle. Um, in sheep and goats, I don't know that it's been you know, something that we've pushed really hard for, but they typically don't have a problem meeting these requirements. Your vet is gonna look at scrotal circumference simply because it's related to semen production. The more grams of testicular tissue a male has, the more sperm he will produce. That is something that's been proven multiple times um, and your female progeny will reach puberty earlier in subsequent years once they're born and actually mature. Their testicles actually do get larger in the fall as well. Again, sheep and goats are seasonal, um, so they will get larger during the fall. Over here on the right is a table for sheep. You can kind of look at this as the minimum requirements. I got this from Purdue Extension. It actually shows you um, all the way up to 18 plus months of age. They should be at least 34 centimeters. And the testicles should be pretty similar. You don't want one um, that's really large and you don't want one that's very small either. You want them to be extremely similar, um, not necessarily identical, but a circumference of this at least when you're going um, to do this breeding soundness exam. This is for bucks. This is from uh, Theriogenology. Uh, pretty similar, but obviously a bit smaller because their testicles are going to be smaller than a sheep. Semen evaluation. A lot of people ask how you collect semen. 
Your vet can do it through an artificial vagina, which I've got down here on the bottom left, electroejaculation, uh, which the probes are located on the right there from Lane Manufacturing. You can actually use that handheld probe on the bottom. I've used those before. Or you can use the Lane Pulsator, electroejaculator. That's what most vets have. Um, they can do bulls. You just need the small ruminant attachment, obviously, um, to get the right placement of that probe. During your semen collection also, the vet will evaluate the penis and make sure there's nothing wrong there uh, that would prevent that male from breeding. The most important part of a breeding soundness exam is probably the semen evaluation. So the sperm from the male have to be at least 30% modal, able to move, and that, that means progressive motility. You don't want the sperm swimming around in circles. They won't get anywhere. You want them swimming progressively forward. Um, so they have to be at least 30% modal. As always, more is better. And they have to have 70% normal sperm cells. We call that morphology. Um, that has to be 70% normal. Some people say 50%, but when you do that, you are, you're kind of lowering that standard. So it depends on how your veterinarian was trained, but of course, higher than 70 um, is better uh, when you look at having normal sperm cells. Over here on the right, here's a few different pictures of sperm defects your vet is gonna look at. Obviously H there, that one has no tail. That's a problem. The tail is the motor for the sperm cell, essentially. It's how it moves and it's how it's gonna make it up through that reproductive tract and all the way to that egg at the site of fertilization. So lots of different sperm defects here. Um, none of these are normal. They all have issues. This one has a flattened head. That one has holes in its head. This one has a, um, a droplet up near its head. It's a proximal droplet. Uh, all of them have different issues. So keep that in mind when your vet is looking at morphology. You need normal sperm cells in order to fertilize the eggs of the females. So classification status. Your vet is going to use a chart very similar to this. I got this from Popstone. Um, they can either classify as excellent, very good, good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. So they're, they're doing this based on motility and morphology. Um, recognize too that a buck or a ram that meets these excellent criteria for sperm, but they have severe foot problems, they may not be able to pass them in a breeding soundness exam simply because they can't move around. So keep that in mind. You can have them rechecked in four to eight weeks if the male actually fails. The breeding soundness exam, you can have instances where fertility will improve, but um, you're going you're gonna to look at a time frame to get that done in. It's not going to improve the next day. Sperm take about 60 days to manufacture, if you will, to produce. So they're going to need at least four to eight weeks to recover from any problem you might find. The bottom line with BSEs. Performing a BSE can help your operation. It can help you identify the ones that are not fertile. Um, it can also help you avoid the remark that you could get when all of your females start getting those Easter egg colors on their butts. This is only if you use a marking harness, obviously, or um, paint on the, the male's chest, but it can help you avoid those situations. How do you get this done? You've got to contact a veterinarian um, that is experienced with performing BSEs and they've got to have the right equipment. So talk to your vet um, for them to get that done. Females, you don't want to forget your ewes either. So a lot of people don't think of this when they're going into breeding season, but evaluate your records from last year. Make sure that you wasn't a problem Make sure she didn't make you raise three bottle lambs and she accidentally escaped that culling that you did a month ago or are about to do here in May. Um, this is not a defined system. It's just a way to get you to think about 
um, looking at your females. Look at those does and ewes and make sure they are going to remain profitable for you. Again, check their body condition score. You may need to perform some management practices to get that body condition score up, uh, but now is the time to do these, this type of thing simply because it's gonna take you a few months to gain weight on these females. Now, parasites. Uh, again, we could talk about parasites for hours and you can get on the internet and find all sorts of good information, but you can also find conflicting information. So the bottom line about parasites, they're always going to be present in our small ruminants. Uh, not many people, uh, you're not gonna see many people go around saying, oh, my sheep and goats don't have any parasites. They probably do. What happens, uh, and especially the season we're about to go into, warm, humid weather encourages hatching of parasite larvae and development of those parasites. So whether it's the barber poleworm or you know a, a different type of internal parasite, these animals pick up that larvae on blades of grass when they're grazing lower, and I think Matt's going to talk about that later, and in manure-contaminated feeders. So regardless, they're going to pick up uh, parasites at some point or another. The key with parasite management is to treat those that need it. Uh, we've kind of gone away from blanket treating everybody, um, and we've kind of gone away from rotating dewormers. Uh, it was said, you know, years ago, you could find advice, oh, give different dewormers, give something new every month. Um, you don't necessarily want to do that because you could be contributing to resistance. And you guys have heard this. I'm probably beating a dead horse with this, but we don't need to encourage resistance of these parasites to the few dewormers that we actually have at our disposal. We don't have 20 different classes of dewormers. We've got three to four that we can use in small ruminants. And we don't necessarily have any new ones on the horizon simply because uh, there aren't a lot of research dollars being poured into this. So I got this picture and this description of parasitism from a paper that you can find online. It's called Managing Internal Parasites in Sheep and Goats by Margot Hale. She had a great breakdown, and I, I wanted to share some of that with you guys. Um, she had a great breakdown about parasitism and, you know, how to manage it. But once you look at your animals, and, and do this as part of your, your breeding soundness exam for your females that you're going to do, look at their body condition, like we've already said. Um, look at their hair coat in the term of, of goats or, you know, just their overall body condition in terms of sheep, in terms of sheep. See if they've had diarrhea or scours. Look for bottle jaw, where they've got a lot of excess fluid around their jaw. That could indicate Hemonchus contortus. And also use the Famacha system to look at their mucous membranes in their eye. Once you get um, a handle on who needs to be treated, then you can treat the ones that are most susceptible. Like I said earlier, all of our sheep and goats are going to have parasites the ones that are most affected are the ones that are the, the most susceptible to, um, to parasitism. They, got, they have a large number of parasites that have overwhelmed their system, and they just have too many, and that's when you're going to start seeing these symptoms. You can also see sudden death. Barber poleworm or Hamonchus contortus can cause sudden death of lambs and adult sheep during the summer, so keep that in mind as well. That's why it's important to do necropsies when you can. This table, I really like this, and I teach it in my sheep and goat class. This was developed by the same people that actually develop, um, that developed the Famacha system. So what you do with this, it's, it's very similar to Famacha. You're gonna look at their eyes, give them a Famacha score, and realize that it could be due to barber poleworm. Um, look at their back, their body condition score. That could be any type of parasite that could cause a lower body condition score. Look at their rear end. If they've got a high DAG score, that's the, the amount of manure that they have around their, um, around their rear end, 
if that is high and you see evidence of diarrhea and scours, it could be the brown stomach worm. Look at their jaw. Um, if they've got bottle jaw, they've got barber pole worm most likely, and it's probably in the later stages. Nasal discharge, they could have nasal bots. Um, it's important to note here too, you see the footnote down there. This system was developed for sheep. Um, in terms of what you would use here would be their hair coat condition. So you, you wouldn't look at nasal bots for goats. Um, but if their coat condition looks really bad, it could be the barber pole, barber pole worm. So this system allows you, along with Famacha, to actually pick out the animals that need to be dewormed. Um, and you want to deworm them before you're going to actually need them to have a good body condition score for breeding. Um, so work with your vet to come up with a combination dewormer that is going to help you. That's one of the recommendations now is to use different dewormers together um, to hopefully kill all classes. You can actually do a fecal egg count reduction test as well. Your vet can help you with that. Um, and there's other methods as well to determine if you have some resistance in your flock or herd. Um, again, there's a, a whole plethora of things to do, but I want us to get away from, and this is kind of what the whole um, world of parasites in the small ruminant world are looking at, is to get away from that blanket treatment. Not everybody needs to be treated every time, but you do need to pay attention to the ones that suffer from parasitism and start breeding against it, breeding for parasite resistance instead of going backwards as well. Um, now I think we're here at Matt's part, but if you think of any questions for the part that I mentioned, um, feel free to drop those in the chat box or um, let us know at the end. One thing I forgot to mention earlier in my slides is flushing. A lot of people have questions about that. That is the practice of increasing your plane of nutrition for your females prior to and during the breeding season. We do this for several reasons. Um, one, it's to keep that body condition score up. Um, and you can flush them with 0.5 to, to one pound of, of supplement a day per head. You can use whole corn or a grain if you would like. Um, but just something to get them, get their system, you kind of trick it into thinking times are good, they've got lots of nutrition, so that then they will ovulate more um, oocytes or eggs for you. This can increase your lamb or your kid flock. Um, be careful though, if you overfeed them at this point, I've, I've had friends do this before, you end up with lots of triplets. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but triplets for my South Downs usually translate into bottle babies. I know some breeds are, they're known for raising triplets, uh, but for me, that's not, not necessarily something I want to, uh, I want to proliferate in my flock. So think about that as well. Matt, you wanna take over from here? Yes, thank you, Jesse. All right, guys. I may have to advance the slides for you, so I'll, I'll do that if I need to. All right, I'll let you know when I'm ready. All right, guys, we're going we're going to transition into talking about forages a little bit, and um, so as I next few slides, I was trying to think about everybody has a different lambing or kidding season, therefore your breeding season is a little different. So um, I'm going to mention the three main breeding seasons. So when I talk about spring breeding, that is for a fall. Uh, lambing and kidding, so that would be you know from May June time period. A summer breeding would be for a a January or February lambing or kidding, so that's going to put you at the end of July, August, September, and then a fall breeding is for your spring lambs or kids. So we're talking about you know your October November time frame. Uh, so there's being in Tennessee or being in the Mid-South, we're blessed with a lot of variety, a lot of things that we can use. So if I am if I am breeding right now for fall lambs or kids, the pastures that I want to choose is going to be your cool season grasses with a little white clover. Um, 
I'm going to talk about this more in length, but I'm trying to avoid red clover and alfalfa at this time. Those are great forages for, for growing animals and lactating animals, but during breeding, we want to be cautious when we use those type of forages. We can also use something that I call bioactive forages, uh, which is your Lespedeza, chicory, plantains. We tend to think those are more weeds in our part of the world because they are, and that's more on the, the hay side of things because those are extremely hard forages to cure and, and to harvest and to save and to store. Uh, but they have some secondary plant um, compounds some condensed tannins, some sequestering lactones. That kind of goes along with what Jesse just mentioned as far as the, the being able to combat parasites. A lot of those, uh, particularly on the condensed tannins, they have an effect on the barber pole worm. Uh, it's evident, particularly when those animals are fed less for diesel. And, uh, uh, they affect that female barber pole worm. They really, if you ever see pictures from um, a microscope, um, she kind of shrivels up and shrinks up and her and her ability to produce eggs is severely limited when those animals are eating something that has tannins. Tannins, as long as they are fed and uh, the right proportion, uh, they tend to uh, trap or capture protein and 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 bypasses the rumen and so that when those proteins make it to the small intestine they're more effectively used by the animal however if, if tannins are too high then we can have some intestinal gut issues and so from research on lespedeza generally no more than if we're talking about young animals we're talking about no more than six to eight weeks at a time on that forage for older Mature animals, it's not a problem. And then some of our summer grasses that you could be using right now, Bermuda, at this time of the year, is, is going to be its highest quality. Uh, if you have any out there, we've had some frost damage this year on Bermuda. And then if you had if you had any luck with early planted summer annuals, um, I've already seen some Johnson grass out there that's about knee high. Uh, I thought that the frost would have uh, hurt that in some areas, but it, it grew right through it. We got some crabgrass that's coming up. All those are very high quality right now. For the summer breeding, to me, that, that is kind of the most challenging part of the year. Uh, one, it's, it's very hot on both your forages and your animals. Uh, the forages tend to be that, you know, they're Will be drier if we are, particularly if we get into a dry summer. Protein levels are generally not as good. Um, and so we got to be a little bit more creative in what we can use. Um, on my summer grasses, I've kind of put them in order of what I would choose. Crabgrass would be my first choice. Um, for summer grass, it doesn't lose its quality as quick as some of these other summer grasses that we have. Uh, sorghum, sudan, pearl millet are two summer annuals that do well. Um, and them along with Johnson grass, they are taller growing plants. And so if I'm running goats this time of year and our major months for worms in our part of the world is gonna be June, July, August and parts of September. And so anytime we can, um, can get those animals off the ground, um, as far as grazing, that's going to be a benefit to them. So we can use some of those forages during that time. Bermuda is my least favorite during that time. They just don't seem to like it very well, both the sheep and the goats. <coughs> Cow peas and lab lab, those are summer annual legumes. Uh, those are cousins, the green beans and purple holes uh, that we all enjoy in our gardens. They're used a lot in food plot mixtures. Um, those work really well during this time. They're a little higher in protein. <clears throat> Again, the bioactive forages, Lespedeza, chicory. Plantain tends to fade as we go into summer, So, but Lespedeza and chicory still puts on some good growth. And um, 
and both the sheep and the goats. Really like chicory. Goats tend to eat the lepidesia better than the sheep do this time of year, but they will eat it. <coughs> and then if we happen to have a kind summer where we have some rainfall, you have no other, you know, you cannot choose any of those other choices. Then your best cool season grass pasture is what you want to choose at this time. Um, in the fall, we want to choose If you have some stockpile fescue in the fall, that works really well for fall breeding. Fescue has a fungus in it, so for the other two breeding seasons, if they're mixed with clover to a certain degree, and I mean white clover, then uh, we can use those, but that fungus tends to bother those animals during that time. And so, but in the fall, it's not, as big of a problem. So <clears throat> we can use some stockpile forage here in the fall breeding. If we have some early planted cool season annual grasses, rye, oats, wheat, rye grass, those work also work very well at that time. And then brassicas like your turnips, uh, your rape, your canola, so your mustards. If we put those in the ground, say in August, they will be ready for fall breeding. They'll be ready for grazing within two months. Uh, and so those all are cover crop options. We can also use shrubs where appropriate. And I'll talk about that here in the next few slides. The picture that you see there on the right, just to give you an idea of in other countries like New Zealand, Australia, and parts of Europe, They've gotten where they use a whole lot more chicory and plantain in their pastures. Um, so you can see the bigger leaf there is chicory in that picture, the broader, narrow, pointed leaf is plantain. We generally have plantain come up naturally in our part of the world, though you may want to sow some chicory, and they you like to mix it with clover. Jesse, if you'll move on, please. So to give you an idea of forages, what they should look like for spring breeding or for right now, um, here's two good options. The one on the left is orchard grass mixed with a little bit of, of white clover. It's nice leafy forage. So that's gonna work really well right now. The picture on the right is some early growth of Bermuda grass that's been fertilized. What I want you to, anytime that you're breeding these animals, we want to avoid any steamy or brown looking pasture. We want, we want to try to put them on as leafy of a pasture as we can. So for right now, these would be a couple options that would work really well. Go ahead, Jesse. For summer breeding, uh, and this is gonna be um, in July, August, September, you know, the picture on the on the left is some nice leafy crabgrass that works well. The picture on the right is some goats that are some Cerisia lespedeza. The goats really like lespedeza. They graze it very uniformly. Um, and those those two forages could work in a summer breeding program. All right, next. And then for our fall breeding, uh, the picture on the left is where some fescue was stockpiled. And you notice that there's, it's basically all leaves. There's, there's very little stem, if any, in that picture there. So that would be a good pasture to put your use or your does on. It's going to be uh, higher in protein at that time of the year, and we're not going to have any problems with the fungus. That, that is a problem in that plant. Uh, the picture on the right, uh, this is actually some of my sheep at the house, but um, that, is a, that is a stand of turnips there that was sown uh, sometime in August, and that's Thanksgiving. And so those are those are some forages that we could definitely use for fall breeding. We'll move on. And this is what I'm talking about here. I just want you to avoid any dead or steamy pasture if possible. I understand sometimes we run into a drought. Um, 
but both of these pitchers would be about this time of year. The pitcher on the left was ryegrass in the winter, and you can see the Bermuda, it's Bermuda's trying to grow through it, so that's probably about June in that picture there. So there's a lot of dead stems as that annual ryegrass is trying to die off. The picture on the right, uh, you can see there's some fescue, there's some orchard grass in that, in that stand as all seeded out. That's probably looking at the latter part of June, 1st of July in that picture. And so for those animals to get anything out of that forage, they'll have to really dig into the stand. And at this time, we want those, those does are used, like Jesse mentioned before, to be in the best body condition that they can be. And so we really don't want them to have to try real hard for their forage at this time. So if possible, avoid any dead or steaming pasture during breeding. All right, next. Tips on using any kind of shrubs. We have many places here in Tennessee that are unutilized and we can, in my research project, when I was working on my master's, we went around and collected samples from shrubs and found that a lot of them are very high quality. And, um, but the animals do have to reach for them. They spend a lot of energy trying to access those those leaves and those tender stems. So they are a resource and should be used, but there's some tips I want to give you in the next slide. <coughs> so this is some samples that we took and this was done on a on a reclaimed coal mine many years ago. So we took samples of the pasture that the animals were standing on. Uh, we took samples from the Sericia lespedeza. All of Malov is an invasive from Asia that was all over the place. And there is some places here in Tennessee we're starting to see more of a problem with. The multiple four rose is the wild roses that you see. And when you looked at the mixed pasture, what they were standing on versus the lespedeza or the all mob or multiple four rose, and those couple of shrubs, Though those shrubs, the leaves, the, the protein was better, the energy was better, the, the TDN there. Uh, the NDF gives you an indication of, of how much those animals could eat. And the lower the number, the better. And you can see from those numbers that it was, those animals could consume more of those leaves and through their body than, than the pasture they were standing on. So, don't underestimate the value of some of those shrubs or the privet or the cedars that you might have on your property. Those those can also fit these animals very well. Next slide. Just understand that when you're using shrubs, be sure that you watch their body condition store. You don't want to these animals to, to wear out these shrubs. They will get to the point where they'll start stripping the bark, they can't, if there's not enough there for them to browse on, provide them with clean water. You may need to supplement them with some energy. A lot of times our shrubs are growing on hillsides. So you, know, you may want to uh, be aware of that, provide their salt and mineral. Oh, which if they're in the shrubs, they're gonna have shade and pay attention to your stocking rate. That goes back that if you stock them food, too high of a rate, they will really start hammering the brows and, uh, and stripping the bark off. And if they get to that point, they won't be able to maintain their weight. And then also be aware of your terrain. After all, you're all trying to get these females bred. So if you do have a ram or a buck that maybe his feet's not the best, then maybe we need to pick a better pasture to put him on so he's not having to chase him up and down hillsides. All right, next. Next couple of slides, I just want to talk about some of the issues about red clover and alfalfa. They produce something called oestrians. And these are some plant compounds that cause negative effects on ovulation and conception. Um, there was a study done 
60 or 70 years ago that was on subterranean clover, clover. And that plant has a lot of oestrian problems in that plant. And it causes infertility in using that study. And so for years and years, people would avoid some of those, those forages during that time. Um, some recent work out of Lincoln University in New Zealand found that maybe more of the problem was is that these plants were affected by fungus during warm, humid weather and also by insects, notably an aphid outbreak. And uh, what they found is, is that it tends to harm younger youth more than older youth. Uh, it may cause some premature udder development in new lambs. And what they found is these forages are good to use uh, during certain times of year, they can really put some weight on these animals. They work great for growing animals out. But if we're going to breed animals, we need to remove them at least two weeks before uh, the breeding season is to start putting them on some other pasture that doesn't have these forages on it. If you got replacement user does, those are your next crop of females that you're going to breed. Maybe remove them a month before breeding. Uh, just to be safe with those animals, but uh, don't neglect using some of these forages because we, like I said, we know they work well for growing animals. They're, they work well during lactation, which just avoid them during breeding. And they need to do some more work in this area trying to understand how these, these compounds work on reproduction. So next. Next slide. So just to give you an idea, both of these pictures have red clover in it. Um, the one on the left, it kind of has a narrow arrow shaped, arrow shaped leaf on it with a watermark, it's very leafy. You don't see much disease in those plants, so that's good for growing animals. The picture on the right, it has went into bloom. And so it's still, the quality of it's probably better than the Johnson grass that it's growing in. But a lot of times this is a picture you're going to get in August, September, if we have a good uh, wet summer. So just avoid those, those areas for breeding your animals during that time. All right, next. So grazing management, um, if you don't have the ability to rotationally graze your animals, at least try to put them on the field and maintain six inches of growth if possible. Um, rotational grazing, rotate them to the next area after you graze down to three to four inches. And I put these couple of pictures here. This is my place. We have three and a half acres that's fenced off. Um, what I simply have done is, is divided the field by that five wire high tensile electric fence and used these electric nets that you can get from some different companies. And we rotationally graze our small flock of sheep. So don't think that you got too small of an area to rotate. Uh, you can still do some, some sort of grazing management or rotational grazing, even on small acres. And, uh, and also, the advantage of using some of these systems, if you happen to be breeding two different groups, you can separate them using some of these nets or some of these type of fences. So uh, don't be discouraged if you're one of those small producers from trying some of these things. So drought, um, use some appropriate grazing management during drought to preserve pasture persistence. Um, this is generally a problem during our, our summer breeding the July, August, September time frame is when we're going to have our most problems with drought. And we can also get that into some of the fall breeding if we have a dry fall. Uh, but I encourage you don't open all the gates. Uh, at least try to maintain some sort of a rotation. Um, just also be aware that you may run into some toxic plants. There's a picture of Perilla mint that we have a problem here in Middle Tennessee. I tend to find that most animals don't seem to like it. You do have some that are exceptions to the rule. Um, 
The only time that I've ever seen animals really want to eat this plant is when there's nothing else to eat. If they have a choice, they tend to avoid this plant. When they eat this plant, it causes hemorrhaging in their lungs and they basically die from pneumonia. And so this is a summer weed. And so we'll start seeing it and it's usually in the shady areas. The same areas that they want to go lay down in on a hot day. Uh, there's some other plants out there to be aware of. Right now, there's a whole lot of poison hemlock in our part of the world that, that is growing. Again, they have a choice. They generally do not. Um, they usually pick against some of these types of animals. Sometimes during drought, we may have to remove animals to save the pasture. So that means you may have to go into a dry lot situation. You may have to use hay during breeding. So if you have to, if you have to do something like that, be sure to forest test your hay. Next. And I'm borrowing some of this data here from a counterpart of mine in Giles County. Uh, he did an interesting deal with his producers um, last fall where he went and sampled the hay in, in several different producers' hay barns. So a lot of times when we cut hay and store hay in um, here in Tennessee, what we tend to do is that we'll put the first cutting at the back of the barn, and then the next cutting will go in front of it, and then the third cutting will go in front of it. So we may have three different cuttings in the same barn, okay? And then, but you may not realize it, but each one of those cuttings are going to be a different quality. And so this is some hay samples that he did um, from one barn, and so, you know, to give you an idea of a breeding animal, a 132-pound animal that it, that you're wanting to breed, whether it's goat or a sheep, they need about 59% TDN. That's their energy. That's their calories that they need. And they need 9% protein. So when you look at the first cut in the hay, he got it tested and it came back 59 uh, percent TDN, the protein came back in excess of 10 percent. So that hay is good. It meets her requirement. So there was no need for adding any corn or soybean meal or any other feed that you might use to her diet. So just the hay alone met their needs. Uh, if they have gotten down to that second cutting, undoubtedly that cutting was a poor cutting. It was the TDN or the energy was below 50%. The protein was a six. So that kind of, those two numbers kind of tell me that was some mature hay. And that animal was only able to eat 2.2 pounds of the 2.8 pounds of feed that she needs. And in order to meet her energy and her protein, she needed 0.4 pounds of corn and 0.2 pounds of soybean meal. And the cost for that per day was going to be 14 cents per animal. Now that may not sound like a whole lot of money, but say if you had 30 head and you're breeding for 30 days, that was $126 for the flock or the herd. The third cutting was a little bit better hay um, than the second cutting. It was still 56% uh, PDN or energy. The protein was a shade under eight, um, a shade under 9%. So she was able to consume a little bit more of her diet in the hay. We did need to provide a little bit of corn, a little bit of soybean milk to make her energy and protein requirements. That came out to about seven cents per head per day. And it was $63 to feed that extra feed to, to that flock or that goat herd uh, during those 30 days. So if we do go in a situation where you're forced to go in a dry lot, I would say it would be advantage to you to, to go ahead and get that hay tested in that case. And you can work with your extension agent on that to get those hay samples done. All right, next please. So that concludes the presentation. Um, if y'all have any questions, be sure to either put them in the chat box or you can ask me and, and Jesse specifically. Just be sure to unmute yourself.
Hey, Matt, I will make a comment not about this, but before Jerry Thompson and the agents and them get off, I, I've got something I want to run by y'all, but I'll do that in a few minutes after you get the question. Uh, do we have any any comments? I have a comment here, Jesse, that that was a nice South End U. And then I, Amanda said it was great content. Do we have any other questions? This is Mark Powell calling from Watertown. Uh, I've got a, a quick question. Um, I know there's some folks out there that are doing, I guess for lack of a better word for it, double cropping with Bermuda and some uh, cool season annuals where they have an established Bermuda, uh, uh, Bermuda ground, uh, Bermuda grass uh, that grows in the summer. And then they've got, so they drill in some, uh, 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 ryegrass or turnips or something like that for for the cool season, and and they kind of get double use out of the forage. And is uh, is that recommended for sheep? Have y'all seen that works in sheep? And also, can you do something similar with with uh, maybe crabgrass in an established fescue field? Okay. I'll answer that. I'll tell you, uh, Mark, what I'm doing. I'm actually doing a double crop crabgrass ryegrass rotation in my house. Wow. A little bit closer. And uh, to make the to make those systems work, um, they do act as puzzle bases to each other. But to get them to to mesh, uh, you got to play around with it a little bit. So in the fall. You generally wait and closer to frost so that that warm season grass is not competing with your new seedlings of whatever grass you choose. So, I mean, you can use rye grass, wheat, oats, rye, you know, you got many options there. And then the, the trick in the spring is be able to, to graze that stand well enough in some cases hard enough and you may end up having to come in and do a little clipping, particularly about the end of this month and first of June, that you can get some light down into the base of that stand so that, that warm season grass can start to come up. Now I can already see that crabgrass is germinated and is trying to come up in the stand at the house. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work where if you're using Bermuda, Bermuda is very shade intolerant. And so sometimes the ryegrass is a little bit more aggressive than wheat. And so, you know, if your goal is to have more warm season pasture and you still want to do this double cropping deal, you might want to use rye or wheat that matures earlier and you get that off the field quicker so that that Bermuda or that crabgrass can go ahead and come on up. Um, so it can be done. I think it's very beneficial for sheep or goats, either one. And um, and I've been doing this now for probably three years of my house. With the the crabgrass, ryegrass rotation, it's worked very well. Have you found the crabgrass comes back year after year, or do you have to replant it? Um, we go ahead and let it reseed at some point during the year. And some of it's going to reseed whether you want to or not. Um, but if you'll go ahead and reseed it and then also do some sort of disturbance to the sod. So like for us, you know, me being a small producer, um, I'm just overseeing with ryegrass because that's the easiest one for me to use. If I want to use wheat or something that's got a bigger seed, I want to drill it into the ground. The ryegrass tends to come up regardless, but I tend in the fall, what I do is I let the sheep graze it as hard as they will. And then I'll clip anything that's left and then I run a drag over the field. And that helps the ryegrass get started, but it also incorporates that crabgrass seed down into the soil bank. And um, if you do need to go back and oversee with some crabgrass, you can do that with a broadcast spreader, spreader very easily. And we're talking about maybe at the most five pounds to an acre, and that's that's only maybe a thirty or thirty-five dollar an acre investment to do that. But 
Uh, what I've learned is after that first couple of years, putting some crabgrass seed out there, that you, you generally start having a seed bank develop. And as long as you do some sort of a disturbance to it at one time of the year, you're going to have crabgrass back. Okay, thank you. And crabgrass, Good job. And crabgrass works very well in your hay feeding areas. Uh, we did a video on that on YouTube not too long ago of some plot work we did here in Marshall County. And crabgrass works very well in the areas where you're feeding hay. Um, check that out. Okay, thank you. You're Good welcome. job, both of you. Thank you. Any other questions? Jerry, you're down there in Alabama. Did you want to comment anything on, on the cool season, warm season rotation? No, I, I think you hit it exactly on, on the head, Matt, for the way I believe it. If, if, if you're not right, then I'm not right either. A lot of pressure there, Jerry. <laughs> It's a pretty low bar. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Hey, Matt, let me ask you just to clarify something you said because I say it all the time. But on the crabgrass, you know, the need to scratch the soil up, it, and I use the phrase that you just used at, uh, at some time during the year. Is it? Is scratching it up in the fall going to accomplish the same as scratching it up in the spring? What I will say to that is, is I'm sure you'll get a quicker stand of crabgrass if you do it in the spring. I'm almost certain of that. But I think the fall, doing it sometime, at least at some point during the year, helps it regardless of the time now. My counterpart down in Moore County, they've been doing crabgrass hay in Moore County for 10 plus years now. And um, he feels like that on some of the varieties of crabgrass on the hay fields, just going across it with the hay rake is enough to incorporate that seed into the ground. Um, and that's on the Red River variety. Now he's not as, he's not as sure as the quick and big variety if that's enough or not. But if you do want a quicker stand in the in the spring with crabgrass, then probably do some sort of some disturbance in April. We'll probably get that a little bit quicker for you. Yeah, I, I think so. But but you know, for a lot of guys, you know, planting the ryegrass provides you some some amount of disturbance, but they don't necessarily have that really if they're depending on reseeding the crabgrass they don't really have that compelling reason to do something in the spring you know it's not a clear-cut case of my ryegrass is done it's time for my crabgrass i mean it kind of slowly transitions from one to the other so and i'll agree about the wheel rates and the example i use on that is the Bermuda grass guys that never plant crabgrass, never want crabgrass, spend a billion dollars a year trying to kill crabgrass, still have crabgrass. And, and I'm, I'm firmly convinced that a lot of it is because of the wheel rates. Yep, I think you're right. So I appreciate it. It's a good job on both of y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If there's not any other questions, we appreciate everybody that was joining us today and, and we'll get this presentation saved and put on, on a YouTube here shortly.